Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 20th of September, and this is Govind Raj Ethiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day oil breezes past $95 a barrel as inflation fears return around the world. Will a 20% tax on outward remittances from October 1st affect outflows? Why are so many graduates working as food delivery agents? A NCAER gig economy report. More countries are automating immigration systems. Should India follow? And Disney to invest $60 billion in theme parks and cruises in focus on real world entertainment. This is a core report with Govind Raj Atiraj. Oil and beyond. We spoke about oil in some detail yesterday and it has now sailed past the $95 a barrel mark. The psychologically important figure of $100 a barrel is now in sight. Oil analysts worldwide are saying this is a 10 month high and is the first time it's happening since November 2022. Crude has risen 30% since end June alone. This price rise has been driven largely by supply cuts by OPEC plus nations like Saudi Arabia and Russia. High crude prices are obviously a threat to inflation worldwide. Countries like India are already facing heightened inflation levels, presently at 6.83%. But embedded in this are high food inflation across pulses, cereals, vegetables and spices, among others. On the other hand, inflation has only just started to come down in many parts of the world. A U-turn at this point would be difficult to digest and manage. In the United States, for example, prices at the pump climbed to their highest level of the year on Monday, CNN reported. Usually, gas prices cool off after the summer driving season ends on Labor Day, but the opposite has happened this year, CNN said, adding that the national average for regular gas hit $3.88 a gallon on Monday, the highest price since October 2022. CNN also quoted the AAA to say that the gas prices have jumped by $0.05 a gallon in the past week alone. The markets, that's the stock markets, were closed on Tuesday in India on account of Ganesh Chaturthi, also kicking off 10 days of celebrations in the financial capital. Speaking of finance and markets, the share of mutual funds to bank deposits is growing sharply. Among other things, it obviously reflects the increase in risk profile and risk-taking ability of Indian savers or a sheer desperation to beat inflation. Depends, of course, on how you look at it. This is equally reflected by the fact that the highest growth rates within mutual funds is in equity schemes. The number of investors in itself has gone from some 40 million to 140 million in the Indian markets in four years and millions more are pouring money into mutual funds and stocks. A report from BOB Research says for August 2023, bank deposits year on year, excluding the HDFC HDFC bank merger, was 12%, while for mutual funds it was almost 19%. Starting 2019, that's the base that Bank of Broda has used, mutual funds have grown at almost 25% compounded annual growth rate to 39 lakh crore rupees, while bank deposits grew only 10% in this period. Speaking of bank deposits, Indian households have saved 19% less in 22-23 compared to 21-22 on a net basis, with the absolute amount of about 13 lakh crore rupees falling to just 5.1% of the economy's GDP. Data released on September 18 by the Reserve Bank of India said, Now at 5.1% of GDP or gross domestic product, the net financial savings of household is at a 50-year low, according to reports. In 21-22, this figure, that's net financial savings of households, amounted to 7.2% of GDP. In the pandemic year, that's 2021, when spending opportunities were limited, net financial savings had jumped to 11.5% of GDP from 8.1% the previous year. Moving on to graduates in gig jobs. Why are gig workers, including food delivery staff, graduate degree holders? What does this say about their mobility and the relative power of that degree? The National Council for Applied Economic Research, or NCAER, a few weeks ago released a survey titled Socio-Economic Impact Assessment of Food Delivery Platform Workers. Now, this report has some interesting findings, which has been put out in public domain a few weeks ago, but there are some more interesting insights. What struck me, for example, was that almost 40% of Tier 2 city food delivery platform workers were college graduates. 
Some 44% of workers were the sole wage earners in their families, 21% were primary wage earners and 33% were secondary wage earners. Almost 70% of workers were non-migrant and were working in their own hometowns. 45% lived in their own homes and the figure was as high as 70% for tier 3 cities. This study was built out of a telephone survey of about 924 food delivery platform workers from one company spread across 28 cities with representation from all city types. The majority of workers, not surprisingly, were below the age of 35. The average age of a food delivery worker was about 29 years and 99.9% or almost 100% of them were, not surprisingly, men. There are many more findings in this report which could be useful to understand what role the gig economy is presently playing playing as a jobs buffer to India's youth in big cities as well as smaller towns. For example, gig jobs do confer a sense of independence and the easy entry and exit from the job, unlike the interview process in a regular job, which is a plus point. Now, the larger question, of course, is how could this evolve? Remember, the gig economy itself is not what it was or promised to be as funding has dried up and many companies in the space have wound down or even shut shop, demonstrating the inherent lack of business case for these companies to even exist. So I reached out to the lead author of this report, Bornali Bhandari, professor at the NCAER, who studies, among other things, the impact of globalization on development and analyzing the skilling from an education, employability and employment or 3E perspective. Approximately 50% of our workers were working 11 hours in a day on platform. Another 50% or were on shorter shifts of five hours each, or they were working on weekends or special days. So the income, it could be additional income. And we find that about 70% of our workers, approximately 75% of our workers, had jobs either prior to joining the platform or they had joined the platform in addition to their primary job. And about 23% of workers were first-time workers into the platform. So there were a lot of students who were working. So for them, it was a step into the world of work. Income is a dominant reason for joining, followed by flexibility, independence, depending on what factors drove them. Of course, 30% of the workers were actually unemployed. 9% only stated that they joined platform work because they were unemployed. But 30% were actually unemployed for almost five months on average before they joined. Ease of entry into this gig work economy, I'm assuming that's one factor that makes it easier for many of them to... Current platform workers actually get an incentive for introducing another worker. So there is an incentive to spread the word around. And relatively easy to enter. All you need is a smartphone. Motorcycle, we what we surprisingly we found that more people owned a two wheeler than a smartphone. Third thing is you need to buy a kit, including the bag and the t shirt. The price of that varied. Sometimes they would borrow it from a friend, and the training process is about a day, it could be online or offline, and by the next day you could be in delivering food. And your study also shows that almost 70% plus of them were non migrant particularly in tier two, tier three cities. So is that an aspiration problem or is it something else? We were curious about that, actually. When we did the work in the focus group discussions, we thought that there were limited job opportunities. But when we actually did the work for all the 924 workers, as you mentioned, we don't find that. We asked them, actually, did you join platform because of limited job opportunities? The answer was no. Remember, we just did it during April to May 2022, just getting out of the pandemic. The pandemic played a huge role. It's not that people lost jobs. In other research that we have done, we found that firms were actually not always cutting labor force. They would either follow them or put them on lower pay. People needed to find additional incomes. So it was just easy to get into, an easy way to add into it. Right. And what's your sense that people are now more open to taking up jobs like this? For example, let's say a graduate typically would aspire for something which is desk bound or obviously a government job. Does this suggest that those attitudes are changing or outlook is changing? I find those attitudes very prevailing, very strong. And this is something whenever I've traveled for work in other places, those attitudes don't change. I think what's the most interesting thing that I found was that there's a very famous book on time pass. Essentially, it covers North Indian men in merit. They are just sitting for government exams for 10 years till 32, and then you're no longer eligible, and then you find another job. Suddenly, this group of young men, they are no longer just sitting at home doing nothing. They are actually working. Now, they are actually doing some productive employment. That is one thing that's stated in the report. The other thing is that when we did the focus group discussions, 
we found that, like, we did it covered it in funny, but we found we have met some young men. We actually asked them, what were you doing before? And they were like, nothing. So now you're doing something. So there is this, okay, what do I do now? I have to start a family and do and so on and so forth. So I'm doing something. So there is a certain sense of achievement and uniform gives you a certain sense of respect. I mean, they also say, they often our parents ask us, what will you do when you turn 45? How long can you continue? I said, no, oh, no, no, we'll be fine. So it's a little surprising for me, to be honest, the researcher, because the, all the stories that you hear in the media were like, they had limited choices and they were out of a job. They were young men who are using this as a step up. Other than income, there are other very reasons. Their own background conditions dominate. Like if you did not actually have your salaries being deposited in your bank account, that was one feature that attracted them. You know, they were like, oh, I have to sit in a nine to five job in a very boring job. And here I am my own boss. I'm flexible. So for them, independence is about having no boss. The terms are very different to what we see in the read in the literature, international literature and otherwise. In the skills literature, we've often heard from firms, give us go to disciplined class 10 kids and we will do the vocational training and get them back. So when you think about it, here's young boys who may be indisciplined or the youth who may be indisciplined in terms of standard manufacturing work or other nine to five jobs, but they might be liking this platform work because it offers them this additional freedom to be what they want to be, whatever, or whatever aspiration they want to be. At least a step up till they can get into whatever the you know, long-term aspiration. But ultimately, the attrition rates are quite high. Again, we interviewed both workers who had left and who had stayed back. In our case, we found that the majority of the workers wanted to leave. They did not want to stay back. So there were workers who had joined prior to the pandemic. They are the ones who are more likely to stay back. Whereas the more recent ones, like ones who had joined a year back or two years back, they were the ones who were more likely to leave. Or people who are more educated, the workers who are more educated and basically joined because they had limited options during the pandemic. They are the ones who are more likely to leave. So we found all these variations there. If you would bear in mind that a lot of the gig economy was also driven by a lot of free cash. I mean, not free, but almost free cash flowing in through the venture capital system. So that would have subsidized a lot of the incomes. And we can see the reverse of that happening now across the board. So keeping that in mind, how do you see or what do you feel is the policy takeaways going forward? I mean, including perhaps the social security part. From a macro perspective, yes, when the things were going good, this thing, but there's always a correction in the market. And I think that is a very natural business cycle issue that always happens. And also from the business cycle issue, we must remember during the pandemic, a lot of workers were laid off or, as I said, were on reduced payments. So they had to put food on the table. So for them, the platform offered a very easy option because it doesn't require much skilling or a particular set of skills. So easy to enter and so on and so forth. So when the pandemic ended, we find that a lot of people would like to go back to their old jobs or old occupations and so on and so forth. So I expect, which we did not know, it would be nice to do a follow-up. Some of these workers probably would be going back to their old jobs now, or hired jobs with higher pay as the firm started recovering. So I think it's a very business cycle approach. And from that perspective, I think it's quite interesting because platform even um, offers both social support during the downward business cycles or otherwise also. And also at the same time, these workers during transition, are, or even in the workers, whether they want to stay here on a temporary or permanent basis, they need social security support. I think that is very, very social welfare support. The question is what type of social welfare support that needs to be quite debated upon on by the government. Another very significant, but we also did not capture that well, we should have actually, now thinking about it. They are always on the road and Indian roads still have a lot of quality improvements to do. So in that case, like sometimes their accident insurance plans are not enough. They're not able to access it for whatever reason. So, you know, we could improve the urban health facilities where they find it easy to access. Public facilities, public health facilities, these urban facilities are becoming quite important if we want as an occupational choice to exist. I think that is something we need to think about also as we go forward. Got it. Onali, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Tax collected at source above 20% from October 1st for overseas transactions. 
come October 1 and life for a lot of Indian citizens who invest overseas will become a little difficult. The government's new 20% tax collected at source rule kicks in. There are now several categories of presumptive tax, as is what it would be normally known as, that could be applicable on money you send out of the country. Of course, you're allowed to, under the Liberalized Remittance Scheme or LRS of the Reserve Bank of India, to remit up to $250,000 in a financial year. Starting October 1st, which is in two weeks' time, which all outward remittances, except for medical and educational purposes, over a threshold limit of 7 lakh rupees in a financial year, will attract a TCS of 20%, which means that remittances such as overseas investments will attract a TCS at 20% over a threshold limit of 7 lakh rupees in a financial year. So, if you are investing more than 7 lakh rupees in foreign stocks, mutual funds, or property in a financial year, be ready to shell out 20% TCS on amounts above that. Now, this deadline is apparently leading to some shifts, some deliberate and some not so because interest in equity investing overseas, for example, has waned. Because of one, people have taken some solid knocks and second, because Indian stock markets are booming. Be that as it may, you will still lock up 20% of every 1 lakh rupees you send out of the country beyond that 7 lakh number in the safe hands of the government of India for several months at the very least. And most importantly, without any interest earned. It's actually a lot if you add it up and it's a good deterrent for investors at least being quite likely the objective the government wanted to implement. In the first of a few conversations on this topic to follow, I reached out to Achin Bharadwaj, Director Asset Allocation for Delhi-based wealth management firm Client Associates and I began by asking him what was likely to happen after October 1st. See, the idea eventually is not so much to collect the tax because ultimately it will be offsetable later on. But it is primarily to discourage people from, you know, remitting uh, large amounts overseas. So that is the primary objective. Basically, you know, two, three things we need to consider. One is that people who are approaching LRS as pure investments or to actually make return out of investing in the international markets. Obviously, you know, those are going to be significantly discouraged. Reason being that, you know, on one side, we are seeing a very buoyant Indian capital market. So the investment opportunities within India are quite significant. And in a global context, people may not find it, you know, so rewarding to invest in the other markets, but to continue to invest in India. And this added hassle of uh, 20% TCS, it is obviously going to discourage those investments. When it comes to real needs, which is basically, you know, to accumulate an asset base overseas, to support one's own lifestyle or one's children later on. I do not think that that requirement is going to get mitigated merely because of the TCS. So it will definitely change the cash flows a bit. So say, for example, before the new guidelines kick in from October, there is a rush to sort of remit money overseas now before the new tax regime kicks in. Once the new tax regime is in place, what in my view is likely to happen is that people will postpone this year's LRS investment towards February, March. Therefore, what will happen is that the time lag between them, between the TCS and then getting the refund, that will be minimized and they will save on the interest. So I think between October to February, March, we are going to see some lull in investments. It's basically a cash flow impact on the real need to sort of, you know, accumulate an asset base overseas and who are having that genuine requirement will continue to repeat. You mentioned two categories, Ajin. One is, you said those who are looking for pure investments, which I would assume is mostly in stocks and so on, or crypto maybe, which of course in any case is now diminished. And the second is the long-term asset creation, including for children and so on. So what is the proportion roughly between the two, Ajin? I mean, let's say in your line portfolio, That proportion actually keeps changing. What was happening was that until last year, because the US market was going gangbuster, people were actually remitting a lot for pure investments. And there was a lot of excitement to invest in companies like uh, Zoom, for example, companies like NVIDIA, Microsoft. So those kind of stock investments, they were pretty much having a lot of mind share. Now, in the last one year or so, we have seen a transition more towards the real needs. As a matter of fact, we are noticing that more and more children, particularly, you know, from the affluent families are going abroad for studies. 
and they need funds to support those educational or residential requirements. And the second need which we have seen emerging in the next year more acutely is basically to create, you know, an alternative residence overseas. So a lot of these golden visa opportunities, particularly say in Europe or elsewhere, those are cropping up and people are looking at those very, very keenly. So I think there has been some transition of sorts from the investments to the real needs. Right, Achin, thank you so much for joining me. You're most welcome, Ruben. HDFC's Managing Director gets a reappointment and Kotak is news to be awaited. Speaking of banking transactions earlier, the Reserve Bank of India has approved the reappointment of Shashidhar Jagadishan as the Managing Director and CEO of HDFC Bank. The bank told exchanges on September 19th. The reappointment is for a period of three years with effect from October 27th, 2023, the bank said. The Reserve Bank of India had first approved the appointment of Jagdishan as CEO of HDFC Bank for a period of three years from October 27, 2020, when he took charge from Aditya Puri. Now, there was nothing in this appointment that was either unexpected or unusual and has been mostly procedural rather than anything else. Where things may not be so procedural is to see who the Reserve Bank will approve as the next head of Kotak Bank, presently being run by an interim CEO, Deepak Gupta, who retires at the end of the year. The bank has apparently submitted two names, including two whole-time directors, KVS Manian and Shanti Ekambaram. There could, of course, be a third name from outside the bank. Kotak Bank founder Uday Kotak stepped down as CEO on the 2nd of September, much ahead of his scheduled departure at the end of the year. He said his resignation was not abrupt and he wanted to sequence it in a way that all senior people and old-timers were not leaving at the same time. This did happen, by the way, with HDFC when Deepak Parekh, KK Mistri and Renu Karnat Sood all stepped down on the same day in sync with a merger with HDFC Bank a few months ago. Speaking of departures and ease of them, in Canada... Perhaps not the best example to quote right now, you can enter the country by merely interacting with a machine for a few minutes, including scanning your passport, having your picture taken and answering a few questions on the screen. No humans. In countries like Korea, you can go through immigration while leaving the country, again without interacting with a human being and again by scanning your passport and getting your picture taken. Singapore is now saying that some passengers will soon be able to depart from its Changi airport without a passport as part of changes to the city-state's immigration law that allows for end-to-end biometric clearance, Bloomberg is reporting. For the first half of 2024, biometrics will be used for authentication at various automated steps in the departure process from backdrop to immigration and boarding, Communications Minister Josephine Teo said in Parliament on Monday. This will reduce the need for passengers to repeatedly present their travel documents at these touch points, allowing for more seamless and convenient processing, Teo said. Singapore, by the way, is gearing up for more traffic and passengers and expecting to return to pre-pandemic peaks shortly, along with building a fifth terminal and a high-speed rail linkage to Malaysia's southern state of Johor, expected to be ready in a few years. And as to why more people will or should come to Singapore in coming years, one answer will follow shortly. In India, by the way, Inbound and outbound immigration can be a matter of luck and chance in terms of time taken in several cities. If your luck is bad, then you could spend hours in the middle of the night, particularly inbound, or you could sail through in literally 10 minutes. India's checks outbound in general seem to be more rigorous than inbound, being of course an anecdotal observation, though shared by many I know. But as we speak of biometric passports and DG Yatra kind of facilities where we clearly have the demonstrated ability to link databases at the back end and authenticate them real time, we could be or should be looking at automating immigration for quicker flows at Indian airports, perhaps outbound to start with and then inbound or inbound for citizens and outbound for all later. Disney to invest about $60 billion in theme parks. And before I go, some interesting news from Disney, which is in the midst of some turmoil at the top deck. The entertainment giant has announced it will invest around $60 billion to expand its theme parks, cruise lines and similar ventures in the next decade. This announcement is interesting because in many ways it suggests at least one firm path entertainment is heading towards, which is more in the world of real-world experiences as opposed to let's say filmed entertainment, though Disney may have separate growth plans for that. Here, the company has said that because of its strong financial standing, it could invest in more parks, experiences and products and said this in a filing yesterday morning with the Securities and Exchange Commission, according to the Wall Street Journal. 
Disney said it would prioritize spending on projects that could generate strong returns, including for the United States and international parks and cruises. Disney has said it has more than a thousand acres of land it could develop into a theme park space. It plans to roll out more cruise ships and establish a new home port in Singapore in 2025, which goes back to the point I made earlier about more people flocking to Singapore. Disney also says it has the largest physical footprint of any global theme park travel business, comprising 12 parks across six sites globally and Disney Cruise Lines, which visits 94 ports in 40 countries. Notably, Walt Disney World Resort is twice the size of the island of Manhattan, Variety magazine quoted the company saying, while Disneyland is the most Instagrammed place on earth and tens of millions of guests travel on Disney's transportation networks each year. Apparently, about 100 million people visit Disney's theme parks each year and there is still more enormous untapped potential for reaching more consumers, says the company. According to Disney's internal research, the addressable market for its theme parks is more than 700 million people. On that note of wanderlust and fun real-world experiences, have a great day ahead. Do log in to www.thecore.in, check out our newsletter and website, and do subscribe to them and, of course, our podcast. Thank you very much once again and see you tomorrow. This was the core report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.